Thank you all for joining and welcome to our session on labor market and employment. Um, my name is Simona Schatter and I'm a research associate at UNU Wider. And today we are going to discuss the labor market implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated policy measures. And we have a very interesting lineup of speakers with broad geographic coverage with country case studies from Latin America, Asia and the Middle East and North Africa. And our speakers will specifically look at the impact of the pandemic on workers depending on the type and location of the activities they engage in, the degree of formalization, as well as important demographic characteristics. Um, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A section of the sessions tab. and We will administer those at the end of the session, so we first listen to all speakers. Um, so without further ado, I would now turn to our first speaker, who is Sama Abdel Maghid, assistant lecturer at the British University in Egypt. And she's going to talk about economic support versus containment measures, an empirical study of the impacts of COVID-19 on labor markets. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. My name is Samara Abdel Maghid. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my paper, which is entitled Economic Support versus Containment Measures, an empirical study of the impacts of COVID-19 on labor markets. So my presentation will include an introduction and the main research question, followed by the main methods and data employed by the study. Then I'm going to present the main results and end up with a conclusion. So the impact of the current COVID-19 crisis are undeniable and felt by all countries in the world. So since the pandemic, states all over the world have first enforced a group of actions that aim to limit the spread of the disease, then they move to adopt a series of economic support measures to mitigate the economic ordeals that accompany these containment measures. Therefore, the main aim of this paper is to investigate the impact of the economic support measures implemented by different countries in the world on the labor markets in face of the negative implications of the containment measures. The research will focus more on the MENA region, which is one of the world's regions that have been already facing many challenges in its economies, where one third of the workers are in the risk of losing their jobs or witnessing reductions in their working hours and wages due to the pandemic. So the, to examine the impacts of the measures adopted by different countries, the study relies on the data of the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker, which are available for over 180 countries and include uh, an overall government response index along with three sub-indexes including stringency, containment and health and economic support. Moreover, to study the microeconomic impacts of the pandemic on people living in the MENA region, the study uses the uh, COVID-19 MENA monitor survey which were available for Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and Tunisia for two rounds in November 2020 and February 2021, comprising a total of 10,478 respondents, including uh, data about their different socioeconomic characteristics. The study fits a group of regression models to examine the impacts of different government response measures on the unemployment rates in 2020, and the logistic um, uh, regression model uh, is fitted to explore the probabilities and the individual socioeconomic uh, characteristics associated with experiencing income decrease during COVID-19 and receiving governmental cash support among people living in the MENA region. So the main results show that many countries have average uh, levels above the world average for the government response index, the containment and health index, as well as the stringency index. However, the average level for MENA is lower than the world average for the economic support index. This can also be shown from the heat map of the overall government response index for individual MENA countries from January 2020 to April 2021, where darker colors refer to higher levels, and it can be shown that the uh, uh, the overall government response index had higher levels in the MENA region compared to the economic support index. Moving on to the results of the regression analysis, it can be shown that the government overall response index had a positive impact on unemployment rates, meaning that it led to higher unemployment rates in 2020. The same also applies for the stringency index. However, 
no association was found between the economic support index and the unemployment rates in 2020. For the microeconomic impacts of the pandemic on people living in the MENA region, according to the COVID-19 MENA monitor survey, among the respondents, 30.7% reported that they witnessed decrease, uh, decreases in their monthly in their household monthly income by more than 25%. Moreover, among those who reported being unemployed in the survey, 53.3% were private sector wage workers, while 17.3% were were employers or self-employed as of the end of February 2020. As for the business difficulties, 18% of the respondents reported loss in demand. As for the changing working conditions, another 18% or uh, an 18% uh, uh, proportion reported changing working hours. And for the governmental cash support received by respondents, the majority of respondents in all of the MENA countries surveyed reported receiving no cash support from the government. Moving on to the results of the, of the, the logistic regression, it has been showed that, uh, shown that uh, females have higher probabilities of uh, witnessing income decreases, also, workers in the informal sector, in, uh, in, uh, in the irregular or irregular workers and wage workers in the private sector have, uh, have also higher probabilities of decreases in income. And moving on to the logistic regression of receiving governmental uh, cash support, it has been shown that uh, living in Tunisia and Egypt uh, is associated with lower probabilities of receiving governmental cash support and working uh, as a private sector wage worker or as an irregular worker uh, is associated with higher probabilities of receiving governmental cash support. Now to conclude, it can be said that government response and the stringency indexes have led to increases in the unemployment rates among worldwide countries during 2020. On the other hand, the economic support measures didn't have any significant correlations, neither with unemployment nor with GDP growth rates. On average, the MENA region had lower levels of adopted economic support measures compared to the world. And in the MENA region, despite of having an average chance of more than 45% of experiencing a decrease in income, the average chance of receiving a governmental cash support was only about 1.5%. The chances of having income decreases during the pandemic in the MENA region were higher than 50% percent among females, private sector wage workers, irregular workers, and workers in the informal sector. Being an unemployed female with less than basic education who was previously working irregularly in the private informal sector is associated with a 90% chance of income decrease during the pandemic and only a 1.8% chance of receiving a governmental cash support in the MENA country. Uh, to conclude, the countries in the MENA region needs to work on expanding and enhancing their targeting mechanisms to reach more of the groups who are most in need of economic support during the ongoing pandemic crisis. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Samar. Um, we directly would move to our next speaker, who is Francisca Pereira based at the National University of General Samiento in Argentina. And she's going to talk about precarization or protection, the impact of digital platform labor for domestic workers in Argentina in times of the pandemic. Many thanks for having us at the conference. Our presentation is about the impact of digital platform labor for domestic workers in Argentina in times of pandemic. Before starting, a very quick note about the significant weight of this occupation in countries like ours. Domestic service represents 6% of the total occupation in Argentina and 21% of all salaried women. And even though the legislation of the activity is highly protective, the main problem to access labor rights has to do with the fact that we still have 75% of all domestic workers in informality. In this context, we decided to study uh, the digital platform Solvers, which is the only digital platform in the sector in the country. It was born in 2014. It reports having nearly 20,000 active workers in the country. And it's important to note that the platform does not charge workers, rather it charges employers for, for each job placement it makes. So the platform is an intermediary in the sector that contacts employers with workers. Also, employers can choose to join what is called the Solvers Payment System, which is not compulsory, but is aggressively promoted by the platform. 
this system implies that for a monthly fee charged to employers, they receive uh, some services from the platform. Basically, the platform takes care of making all the payment of workers' salary each month through an automatic debit from employers' bank accounts. And also, if the employer wishes so, the platform formalizes the worker. And this means that the platform takes care of all the bureaucratic procedures to do so, and also, again, takes care of all the monthly payments for Social Security by debiting uh, them from the employer's uh, bank account. This has benefits for workers as well. They get a free bank account open when they receive the payment to, through solar system, a debit card, a credit card, and they also access personal loans, which are highly valued by them. Our work is based on in-depth interviews with platform workers, plus a survey of 300 platform workers, where we were able to collect information about nearly 1,000 job positions. And we asked about job positions before and during the pandemic in order to establish comparisons. We also used to the, our Argentina's household permanent survey in order to establish comparisons between solvers and the sector as a whole. In this slide, we consider registration rates outside and inside the platform, and we restrict the analysis to job positions of up to 23 weekly hours because 95% of all jobs created by solvers do not surpass that time limit. This is the platform uh, overrepresents short hour positions, is more successful in this segment of the, the sector, and these are particularly the job positions that have been more resilient to formalization policies in the country. In solvers, this kind of job positions have a registration rate of 43% in comparison with 16% at the national level. And if we consider uh, jobs that are paid via the solvers payment system that I referred to before, the registration rate goes up to 66%. As the testimonies of workers show, solvers constantly sends information about labor rights and registration in particular, and many times workers use this information as a backup in order to negotiate with employers. To finalize, what happened with job protections in the platform during the pandemic? Domestic service was indeed one of the most affected occupations worldwide in terms of job destruction. In graph three, we do observe that registrations imply higher rates of job preservation within the platform, and this is also the case outside the platform. However, we also want to share this other graph with you, which might look as a paradox, because even if the platform exhibits much higher registration rates, in global terms, job destruction was significantly higher here. As we can see, more than half of the job positions were lost, whereas outside the platform, this percentage drops to 20%, which is still high, but job destruction was much more devastating within the platform. This apparent paradox has to do with what we call the vulnerability effect of short work in our positions. Dismissal costs consist of one monthly wage per year, and since salaries are very low because in the short working hours, the severance pay becomes very accessible. Plus, the rotation in this type of positions is considerably higher than in full-time positions, and most workers do not reach more than one year in the job. Thus, the dismissal cost tends to consist of a very low monthly wage. This trend is verified in the sector as a whole, but obviously becomes more intense in solvers because this is the type of job insertion that prevails here. To conclude, the platform shows an interesting capacity to promote registration precisely among those work positions that have proven more resilient to formalization policies. This is short work in our positions within the sector. And the tools used by the platform to promote registration have to do with constant information and regulation disseminated among workers and employers. And also the solver payment system constitutes an additional incentive as it offers to take care of bureaucratic procedures and payments required by registration. Since there are numerous employment agencies intermediating in the sector, perhaps these are tools that are worth to promote and expand. In terms of the pandemic, even though registration did have a protective effect against job destruction, this was severely reduced within the platform because of the vulnerability effect of short working hour positions that prevail in the company. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your question. Thank you, Francisca. Um, our next presenter will be Subaria Andlip.
assistant professor at the Department of Economics, Federal, or the University of Art, Science and Technology, Islamabad, Pakistan. And she's going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on labor market outcomes in Pakistan. Glory to Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to say thanks to UN Wider for organizing this conference on the most important theme of our times. And thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to present our work in front of esteemed discussant and audience. I'm Zubari Andlib, and I'm working as an assistant professor at Department of Economics, Federal Urdu University of Art, Science and Technology, Islamabad, Pakistan. And today I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on labor market outcomes in Pakistan. And I think this study is really relevant for the other developing economies as well. So let me introduce the topic first. The COVID-19 pandemic is an example of the global economic crisis in recent times. It has affected almost every sector of the economy. Women and young workers and those who are working in informal sector are more affected by this pandemic. According to ILO Monitor, almost 9% of global working hours were lost in the last year, which is alternatively equivalent to 255 million full-time jobs. So here comes the implication of the human capital theory as education helps individuals to cope up with any kind of disequilibrium. On this slide, we have presented the snapshot of the Pakistani labor market. We can see overall male and female labor force participation rates are almost stagnant um, or have very little variation for the last decade. Irrespective of the gender, most of the employed persons are working in informal sector for the last 20 years. We have found immense literature about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on labor market outcomes for different economies around the globe, but we could not find any notable study in case of Pakistan. Based upon the previous discussion and facts and figures, now we are able to specify the objective of the present study. The present study is the first ever attempt to capture the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on labor market outcomes in case of Pakistan. We have applied linear probability model and binary logistic model. Um, the first model dependent variable is employment disruption. In the second model, the dependent variable is employment loss. And in the third model, we have taken both employment disruption or employment loss as a dependent variable. Whereas XI represents different discriminatory variables. We have used the special rapid appraisal survey conducted by the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics during October, November 2020. The sample size comprised of uh, 6,000 households across Pakistan and almost 23,000 individuals aged 10 years and above. So this is a variable description table and we have included different age groups, educational categories, occupations and uh, employment statuses and also region and province of residence. Descriptive statistics. According to the descriptive statistics, most of the younger workers who belong to the age group of uh, 15 to 25 years have to suffer from employment disruption or employment losses. Male constitutes the highest share uh, in the employment losses category. Married workers comprise a sizable proportion in the three groups that are employment loss, disruption, and same status. Workers with no formal education represents the highest proportion of the sample across all categories. The highest proportion of employed in the same status groups are skilled agriculture workers, followed by the workers in elementary occupations and service workers. Most urban workers have to suffer from employment losses as compared to their rural counterparts. Over empirical results provide two interesting policy insights as compared to the age group of 46 years or older, young workers who belong to the age group of 15 to 25 years are more likely to face employment losses. Male workers were uh, less likely to suffer from employment disruptions compared to female workers. Male workers had a lower probability of both experiencing employment disruptions as well as employment losses. The empirical results show a higher probability of uh, employment disruption for almost all education levels compared to the base category of no formal education. Workers employed in white collar jobs having a high probability of facing employment disruptions compared to the workers in elementary occupations, legislators and senior officials and professionals, skilled agriculture workers and technicians had a lower probability of losing employment uh, compared to the elementary workers. In terms of employment statuses, the result revealed that uh, paid employees, self-employed and employers all had a high probability of uh, both experiencing employment disruption and employment losses. 
individuals residing in urban areas of the country have higher chances of experiencing employment disruption but have low probability of suffering from employment losses the special survey also collected information on the different types of uh, social protection benefits that the affected household were receiving or had received during the pandemic period 24% of individuals who lost their jobs received cash transfers through the SRS emergency program that was launched as part of the fiscal stimulus package announced by the government of pakistan to provide basic income support to low income households here are the conclusions of our discussion a uh, worker who belong to the younger age group are more likely to suffer from employment disruptions as compared to the reference category uh, kpk province workers belong to the other three provinces are more likely to face employment losses the empirical estimates also reveal that there is less probability for skilled agriculture workers and technicians as compared to other occupational groups to suffer from employment disruptions workers in most occupations faced a lower probability of employment loss compared to the reference category of elementary workers However, workers with degree level of education had a higher probability of facing employment disruption, while workers with metric and above level of education were less likely to experience to um, in employment loss. Our empirical analysis indicates that to improve the situation for those workers who are suffering from employment losses and disruptions, the government should design special program and policies to provide employment opportunities to the low income and vulnerable segment of the employed community. The empirical analysis also highlighted that there is a need to improve the education level of the adult workforce to uh, increase their resilience to any future employment shock. In future, expanding the access to secondary and higher education is particularly important in this regard. It is also important to focus on digital literacy among the employed workforce. There are few limitations, and also we propose the future dis- directions. thank you so much and i'm looking forward for comments or suggestion to improve our work great thanks a lot um subaria just a reminder for our audience to also drop questions in the q and a section i try to start off the conversation with two questions there and please feel free to add we would then move to our next speaker who is anand fakir phd candidate in economics at the university of western australia Anand is going to do his presentation live, and I'm going to announce one minute left after six minutes, if that's okay with you. Um, so please, the first, yes. Thank you, Sitman. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, we're looking into um, essentially the role of mobility restrictions in halting the spread of COVID-19. And this study was inspired by essentially the lives versus livelihood debate that's been going around um, lately, right? So. Um, Uh, we know that due, due to the COVID-19, we've seen the biggest state-led mobility and activity restrictions. There is a debate as to whether it's it was too slow and insufficient, or whether it was too extreme, and also is it too much or too little? And there's there's a wide literature out there that um, mentions that it really depends on the effectiveness of these measures. They're not they're examples of when they're not always successful and can worsen the situation. So um, to that effect, uh, what we're really interested in in this uh, in the study is how effective are these measures in containing the COVID-19 contagion and what contribute to the effectiveness. Uh, but of course, we know that any studies like these are prone to endogeneity. So uh, we know that restrictions are in uh, response to expected disease situations of the future, uh, whereas watchful populations and governments can take early action. So we have to account for this endogeneity. Uh, the way we um, l- address this endogeneity is we focus the studies mainly on the first phase and taking the perspective that governments in deciding the level of restrictions um, looked at not only the disease situation at their home country, but also what they would expect to happen in the absence of measures, uh, of strict measures. So they looked into uh, actions taken by the surrounding countries as well. Um, assuming that your countries around you are imposing stricter restrictions, there would be a greater pressure on your own country to enact the same. So um, based on that, we develop a two SLS model. So it's an instrument variable approach where we look at the stringencies um, in the countries in the particular sub-region, except my own country, to instrument for how much stringency I would be enacting in my own country. And then 
essentially using that to figure out its effect on growth rate of cases and um, other um, other outcome measures as, I, as I'll quickly show. Now, the exclusion criteria here, I will get back to that in a bit. But before that, the data comes from 127 countries and we focus on the first phase, so 15th Feb to 30th July. We take uh, stringency measures from the Oxford OxGRT government response tracker. The mobility data comes from the Google mobility data. And the tests, cases, and deaths um, data comes essentially from the Johns Hopkins uh, repository and also from our world in data. Now, the exclusion restriction hinges on, for example, if I am responding um, to restriction measures in other countries but not in my own home country, the, um, the instrument becomes invalid. So in that case, we see that that really doesn't happen. In day zero is when the country went under a national lockdown. And we see that that's when stringency jumps up. And that's also where mobility restrictions tend to fall down in the majority of the cases. OK, so the first set of results is just showing that there is a lag 0 and lag 14 and 5. In fact, this goes on to lag 8, 28, but we don't show that here that as the stringency index goes up, there is a reduction in mobility across all these measures and increase in residential mobility. Okay, and we also see a similar effect in terms of case to test ratio and death to test ratio. These are the two measures we will be focusing on, and we believe these are the better approximation of this measure. Now, we know that COVID, is, um, COVID data is riddled with a lot of limitations, which I'm happy to talk about later on. So the next thing we do is we break the effect by certain uh, characteristics of the country, and this is by population demographics and also by other measures such as corruption perception index, democracy score, government effectiveness, and so on. So um, in, in a nutshell, what's really happening is that restrictions curb mobility better in developing countries. Surprisingly, we weren't expecting this, at least using the Google mobility data that we're using. Um, essentially, countries that are more densely populated, poor or more unequal or more polluted, younger but healthy populations and more health infrastructure, restrictions seem to work better in these countries. However, restrictions contained the contagion better in developed countries, countries that are richer, more equal, less polluted, older but healthier populations, better health infrastructure, countries that are more democratic with better government effectiveness. Now, um, this does not necessarily mean that less mobility uh, translates to better contagion containment. OK, so um, the next thing that we try to see is that um, compared to changes in mobility, so only due to changes in mobility due to stringent policy measures, how much of the growth rate of the contagion was affected. So we use a three-stage recursive CMP model to assess that. And um, the results are fairly in, in line. Um, so the way to interpret this table would be that a one unit increase in transit station mobility causes cases to test, test ratios to increase by this amount. And once again, we see that countries that manage to curb uh, mobility better due to stringent measures um, acted better in countries that have more education, that have um, more older age pop, uh, population that have a greater CPI score, democracy score, government effectiveness, hospital beds, and so on. So what's really happening is that um, the reduction in mobility is not really curbing the contagion as much in developing countries as much as it did in developed countries. Now, there are multiple reasons that can happen. Uh, that led to this happen, and I'll leave that for the discussion later on. But in conclusion, what I want to point out is that we need to complement restriction policies with awareness and other assistance schemes in developing countries. Mobility restrictions are not al alone not sufficient in developing countries as it is in developed countries. I think I'm right on time, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Alman, and great timing. Actually, I didn't have to jump in just on time. Perfect. Uh, we would then, before moving into the discussion, move to our last speaker, who's Mino Higa, um, PhD students in economics at Simon Fraser University. And he's going to present about the persistent effect of COVID-19 on labor outcomes evidence from Peru. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Mino Higa, a PhD student at Simon Fraser University. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, this paper that is titled The Persistent Effects of COVID-19 on Labor Outcomes, Evidence from Peru. This is joint work with Carlos Ospino and Fernando Aragon. 
So uh, there are several studies that examine the effects of COVID-19 on employment. They have documented uh, large negative effects, especially for vulnerable workers. Uh, and these studies have focused their attention mainly on short-term effects during the first months of the pandemic, which is useful to identify initial causes of lockdowns. But it is less informative if societies adapt to the shock. In these studies, there is also limited evidence about Latin America and in particular about Peru, despite being one of the hardest hit countries in the world. As you can see in this graph, where you can locate Peru in the top left corner uh, with the largest confirmed deaths per million people and also the largest drop in GDP. And this is for the second quarter of 2020. So in this paper, we answer the question, what are the short and medium term effects of COVID-19 on labor outcomes? Um, something important uh, to notice here is that uh, we, uh, we can only identify uh, the bundle of shocks related to the pandemic, but we won't be able to identify specific policies like uh, social distancing or lockdown uh, from other phenomena that is happening in the disease environment. Um, we're going to focus our analysis for Peru and in particular for Lima, which is the capital city that uh, concentrates one third of the population, one third of the labor market, half of the GDP, and also half of the COVID-19 cases and COVID-19 death related. To answer this question, we are going to use an event study framework, and we are going to take advantage of uh, the panel of individual that we have in our data set that covers the period uh, from January 2019 to June this year. So our results uh, from the event study are presented uh, here. So first, we corroborate uh, the dramatic uh, drop in uh, labor outcomes uh, at the beginning of, of the pandemic uh, found by other studies. But something else to notice is that this negative effect attenuates over time. However, it is persistent and sizable uh, even by the second quarter of uh, this year. Uh, so this graph is for our work, and we have uh, similar results for labor income. A uh, limitation in this study is that uh, there might be some changes in sample composition. So for instance, some subpopulations uh, uh, maybe were difficult to survey during the pandemic. So to address this, uh, we check two things. So first, we check the sample size uh, in the months before and after the pandemic. And except for March 2020, uh, all uh, months have uh, similar sample sizes. And second, we uh, did this exercise uh, that is reported in the table. So what we did here is, is uh, we restrict our sample or we restrict our analysis uh, to the observations uh, that are in our uh, panel uh, data. So if you want to address uh, changes in composition, uh, let's keep uh, those uh, individuals who were before and after the pandemic. So in columns one and three, what you have is uh, the estimates that we use uh, to build the graph that I showed you before. But in column two and four, I restrict the observations to the panel sample and we control for individual fixed effects. So there you can see that uh, simil results are very similar uh, for hours work and labor income. Um, using also our panel sample, we explore who were more neg negatively affected. So in the first lockdown, informal and less educated workers were more affected and there is a, a sizable difference. So the magnitude of the negative shock is half if you are a formal and better educated worker. In the medium term, less educated workers, workers in vulnerable industries um, like retail, hospitality, and transport, and women with small children were more affected. And regarding this last point, uh, we find some suggestive evidence of within household relocation of labor 
because in households with small children, uh, women decrease their hours of work and income, and we find the opposite effect for males. And once we analyze uh, the effect of having uh, small children for the entire household, we don't, we don't find any effect. So uh, apparently uh, these uh, negative effects for females and these positive effects for males offset uh, when we look at the household level, uh, when we look at the outcomes at the household level. So to conclude, this persisting negative effect uh, highlights the limitation of policy and the capacity of the society to adapt to the shock and also suggests uh, that econom the economic costs will be significant uh, as long as uh, there is a threat of COVID. And this is relevant for the less developed countries where there is a slow progress in vaccination and there is a threat of surge of more aggressive variants. And finally, our heterogeneous effect suggests uh, uh, some long lasting effects. For instance, the increase in the income gap between educated and less educated workers and the awakening of uh, women's bargaining power within the household. So that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I hope we have Francisca back on stage soon and we have about eight minutes left for Q&A. Um, let me maybe go in the order of the speakers and ask the first question to Samar who investigated the impact on a number of um, um, in our countries, and I was wondering to what extent you could further disentangle the effect of this government stringency measure with is the effect of the pandemic overall, so to say, like whether you control for how large or how much a country and the economy had been affected by the pandemic shock as such, and try to disentangle this further from the government stringency level to try to give an idea of how we can attribute this employment effects. I think you're muted. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the question. So um, the database, which is uh, the Oxford Government Response Tracker database, has several indexes to uh, detect the uh, response to, uh, to the pandemic. Um, it has the overall response index, and then it have uh, it, it has three sub indexes. So um, I try to disentangle the effects by um, running the model or using each one of these sub indexes. So I examine the effect of the overall government uh, response index, which combines all of the indicators used to measure the responses. Uh, and then I try to examine the, the effect of the stringency index, which includes some measures such as the uh, closure uh, restrictions of schools, uh, of public uh, places and social gatherings and so on. Uh, and I found that the, the overall index and the stringency index um, uh, both have uh, like negative impacts. To get the association or the correlation focusing on the economic support index, which is again one of the sub indexes used to measure the overall government response index. But I found no correlation or no association between the, uh, the economic support index, which is measured mainly by the support given by the government to workers who lost their jobs or uh, who lost part of their income, and also the debt that relief um, that some governments have offered, but I couldn't find any relationship uh, uh, between the economic support index and the unemployment rates. So um, I try to investigate the impacts of the different indexes um, used by the database to measure the different aspects of the responses regarding the unemployment rate in order to uh, disentangle these effects. Thank you for the clarification. I think yeah, you just think and I mentioned like, it's hard to identify possibility here as policies that usually open and not just to the top, but it's quite interesting to see the patterns. Um, my next question was to you, Francis, and I'm wondering, like, it has this kind of dual effect of the digital platforms. So, like, I think in the first part of the presentation, it was quite positive, patriotic, painted, but actually increasing registration and mobilization. 
and in terms of this talk, it seemed like the quality of the translations in terms of the value they had for the workers in terms of that wasn't so high. And I just wondered, what is your takeaway, maybe in a quick response, like on the value of those platforms? Okay, um, in terms of formalization, in, the, in terms of the particular dimension of formalization, the platform effect is positive uh, because workers' access to labor rights such as paid holidays, um, a minimum wage, uh, and so on. But the problem is that um, they have short working hour positions within the platform and short hour positions are more vulnerable to job extraction uh, this is this happens inside and outside the platform. The problem is that they predominate within the platform. So perhaps some uh, particular policy in terms of these short hours positions and the severance pace they imply, because uh, it's very easy to dismiss a worker that even if she's formal, uh, if she works for very, very low hours, uh, she will lose the job during the pandemics, uh, for example. So in, in this particular dimension, formality, the platform uh, has very positive effects, but um, it, because of the nature of the features of the, the jobs that predominate within the platform, uh, job stability is not one of the positive outcomes, not for the platform, not outside the platform. Um, and there are other aspects of the platform I want to point out that are not very bright, but because of time restrictions, we couldn't develop them. Um, I don't want to paint a picture. <laughs> the platform <laughs> is a, an excellent tool because it has many problems, for example, opaque uh, qualification systems, um, low wages, uh, lower than outside the platform, and so on. But um, in terms of formality, which is a bit concern in Argentina when it comes to domestic service, the platform has a positive outcome, but it doesn't reach protections because of the short working hour positions that dominate within the uh, the company. Uh, I, um, thank you so much for the question. And um, yes, in this in this survey, we are considering the earning loss only. And secondly, we have uh, labor force survey data for a longer time period. And the last uh, round of uh, this survey was conducted this to, in 2017-18. And uh, so in the next round of survey, I expect to get the data about the post-COVID scenario of employment and unemployment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to all the speakers and to the audience. And Adnan, uh, maybe I can ask you now if you still want to hang on or, yeah. or I can send you a message. OK. Uh, I had been wondering about your result um, where we see kind of a larger reduction in mobility in developing countries, but then a more pronounced effect in the developed countries. And I was wondering whether we have some type of selection effect there that you're maybe in your mobility data and the Google mobility data only capture the better part of the population, kind of more likely to be able to stay home on the one hand. And then the other, one, I was wondering about whether we might have some type of settlement effect of people just living in very densely populated areas in some sort of township or other type of slum environment where you don't need to move far to get in touch with many people, kind of, and therefore. So just thinking about those two possible channels uh, and your thoughts on this. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, we do control for population density um, at, at a quite a minute level. So that it's that's not something we're worried about but we think that the data is definitely selected um because, simply because um google mobility data traces people who uses their google accounts and etc so there's definitely a selection bias happening there so that's why we don't like stressing on that particular set of results because it doesn't make sense and there, there's definitely a selection issue going there but i thought what was more important is the fact that simply the of grt and without using the mobility data we do see a stronger uh, falling, containing the contagion um, in, in developed countries. And um, that's what we wish to focus on a bit more. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. There is a selection going on there. And there is another thing is that we can't disentangle. Um, so for example, when people are self-disciplining versus actually responding to stringent measures, um, the effect is capturing both of them. We can't disentangle the two. Like, is it due to the stringent measures or is it due to a certain subset of the population being 
self-disciplining themselves. Yeah, that's another caveat that we have. Thank you, Simon. That's that's you're absolutely spot on. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. And now I can actually verbally thank all the presenters and the audience for this very nice session and i think what we saw across the presentation is that informal workers and workers in more vulnerable type of positions have been particularly affected by the pandemic um, and there remains much need for policy to address this in their post-pandemic context um, thanks so much and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference see you all thank you thank you bye